Okay, imagine swapping a daily pill for uh, just a twice yearly shot to prevent HIV. Right. And what if that solution, which sounds really expensive at first glance, is actually set to you know revolutionize global health equity? Mm -hmm. Today, we're diving deep into lanacapavir. Mm. It's this groundbreaking drug that's not just uh, powerful scientifically, but it could really redefine accessible health care for millions. Yeah, and what's really fascinating here isn't just like the raw effectiveness, though that's impressive. It's how elegantly it tackles some of the biggest real-world problems in public health. Like adherence. Exactly. Adherence is a huge one. So we're going to go beyond just what Lena Kapavir is and really dig into why its impact could be so, well, profound. So our mission for you in this deep dive is basically to unpack the science behind it, understand why it's such a massive leap forward, even with that initial cost, um, and trace its potential to really transform HIV prevention and treatment mm, globally. Yeah. Think of this as your shortcut to getting up to speed on one of the biggest things happening in health right now. Okay. All right, let's jump straight into the news then. Because just in the last month or so, Lana Kapavir, that twice yearly shot we mentioned, it's made some really rapid, uh, significant moves globally. It really has. Things are moving fast. We're seeing major regulators green lighting it super quickly. Like, uh, June 18th, 2025, the US FDA officially approved it. And just to clarify that FDA approval is specifically as an injectable HIV-1 capsid inhibitor. Okay, capsid inhibitor. Yeah, think of the HIV virus like a tiny machine, right? Yeah. The capsid is its protective outer shell. So this drug, lanacapafir, it attacks that shell, stops the virus from multiplying and spreading. Got it. And the approval is for pre-EP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, mm -hmm. basically helping people at risk prevent infection before it even happens. Right, pre-EP. Okay. And it's not just the U.S. moving fast. No, not at all. The European Medicines Agency, the EMA, their advisory committee, recommended it for approval on July 25th. Formal EU approval is expected later this year. Mm -hmm. Seeing that kind of you know quick, simultaneous movement across continents for a new drug, mm -hmm. it, it says something. It really does. And... Uh, Putting that into a wider perspective, look at the World Health Organization's reaction. That tells an even bigger story. How so? Well, they didn't just, like, welcome the FDA approval on June 19th. They followed up really quickly, issuing their own guidelines for using it in HIV prevention just a few weeks later, July 14th. Wow, that is fast for the WHO. It is, and it highlights this crucial public health idea, giving people more pre-P choices. Well, that has the potential to seriously increase how many people actually start and effectively use HIV prevention. Because they can pick what works for them? Exactly. It empowers individuals to choose a method that genuinely fits their life. That personal preference, it's absolutely vital for making a difference in the real world. Okay, so summing this part up, linacapavir isn't just about prevention, right? Not at all. Studies have also shown it can really hammer down the virus, achieve significant viral suppression, even in people where other drugs have stopped working because of resistance. So it's got this dual power. Precisely. It makes it an incredibly powerful and, frankly, much-needed tool for both preventing HIV and treating it. Okay, let's dig into the evidence then, the science behind these approvals. You mentioned the FDA clearance rests on some impressive 2024 results from two big trials, Purpose mm. 1 and Purpose 2. That's right. And these weren't small studies. We're talking thousands of participants, multiple countries. It gives us a really robust set of data. And these were phase three trials. Correct. Phase three means they're among the final large scale human trials needed before a drug gets the green light. They're also double blind. Meaning? Neither the participants nor the researchers knew who was getting lenacapavir versus uh, the comparison drug. Helps avoid bias. Okay. And randomized, so people were assigned to groups by chance. Makes the comparison fair. Got it. That context is really helpful. So let's start with Purpose One. What did that show? Okay, Purpose One was designed very carefully. It looked at the safety and effectiveness of this twice-yearly subcutaneous shot for pre-P. Subcutaneous meaning under the skin. Exactly, just under the skin. The trial involved a large group over 5,300 cisgender women and adolescent girls, age 16 to 25. And where was it conducted? That seems important. Very important. It was done at 25 sites in South Africa and three in Uganda. 
This is key because it tested the drug in diverse groups in places where, you know, HIV incidence is still tragically high. And the findings. They were. Yeah. Well, pretty groundbreaking doesn't quite cover it. Oh. In the group getting linacapavir over 2,100 participants, there were exactly zero new HIV infections. The rule. Zero. Now, compare that to the control group. They got a standard once-daily oral Piro EP pill, Truvada, okay. in that group. With a similar number of participants, there were nearly 40 infections. Wow. 40 versus zero. The difference wasn't just statistically significant, it was profound. It pointed to almost perfect effectiveness for lenacapavir in this specific population. And Purpose 2, did it back this up? It absolutely did. Purpose 2 was another big phase 3 trial, over 3,200 participants. This one focused on cisgender men, transgender individuals, and non-binary people. A different demographic focus. Right. And geographically broader, too. 88 sites across Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Peru, South Africa, Thailand, and the U.S. The really global. Definitely. And here, they found only two participants getting the linacapavir shot became infected with HIV. Okay, two. Compared to? Compared to nine participants in the group taking the daily oral Truvada. That's still a big difference. A very big difference. Yeah. And just for context, the background rate of new HIV infections in the population screened for this trial was pretty high, over two cases per 100 people per year. So reducing infections that dramatically is hugely meaningful. So this level of effectiveness, especially from just a twice a year shot, I feel like it changes everything for prevention. It really does. It fundamentally shifts how we can approach prevention. It directly tackles that daily adherence challenge, the sort of Achilles heel of oral pre-EP for so long. Right. It basically moves prevention from something you have to think about every single day to an event just twice a year. That's a game changer psychologically and practically. Which brings us right to, well, the elephant in the room. Ah, uh, yes. The cost. Exactly. Lena Capavir, you said, comes with a price tag around $28,000 for those two shots per year. Mm -hmm. Compare that to generic oral PVP, like Truvada, which mm -hmm. is, you know, super chic and available almost everywhere. So why would anyone choose Lena Capavir with that huge cost gap? And this is where we need to connect the science to the messy reality of, well, human behavior in real-world healthcare. It's a point Dr. N. Kumasami really emphasizes. He's the chief and director of the VHS Infectious Diseases Medical Center. That's him. And he offers this really crucial insight. He says, basically, oral PEP will be effective only if there is 100% adherence. Only if. Right. The oral drug won't work even if it is missed for a day because the drug level will be only 24 hours. Think about that. One missed day and your protection drops significant. That's a thin margin for error. It really is. And Dr. Kumar Sami points out the real world struggle. People who have the highest risk have to take the drug every day. Taking a tablet every day, even for a diseased patient, is so difficult. Life gets in the way. Totally. People forget routines get disrupted. He says they tend to miss a dose, which is why adherence is never 100%. Even with strategies like on-demand pre-P, where you take pills around potential exposure. Yep. He notes that adherence still rarely gets above 85 90%, and his point is stark. Pre-P will work only if the adherence is 100%. The reality is perfect daily adherence is just incredibly hard for most people to maintain long-term. So the implication is, mm -hmm. even though the pills are cheap and seem easy, the actual effectiveness in the real world is limited by people not taking them perfectly. Precisely. And that's why there's this huge momentum behind long-acting injectables, things that protect you for months at a time, taking that daily burden away. We've seen this with other drugs too, right? Like cabotegravir. Exactly. Cabotegravir is given every two months, intramuscularly. And it was found to be superior to daily oral PPP. But still had issues. Yeah. Dr. Kumarasamy pointed out that even every two months... Well, people still forget. Life happens. So that six-month window for Lena Capavir. Yeah. That's the real breakthrough here. Yep. It's a massive step up in convenience and likely real-world adherence. And interestingly, Lena Capavir was actually first developed back in 2021 as a treatment drug. Oh, for treatment. Yeah, specifically for people whose HIV had become resistant to other drugs. But because it naturally lasts so long in the body, scientists realized its potential for prevention. A great example of repurposing innovation. Absolutely. Finding new ways to maximize impact. And Dr. Kumarazami has quite a view on Lena Kapavir's potential, doesn't he? He really does. He calls it a robust molecule and uh, the best solution in the absence of vaccines. He even makes the striking comparison. Vaccine comparison. Yeah. He suggests 
In the absence of an HIV vaccine, I think the pre-exposure prophylaxis every six months can be considered like a vaccine. Like a flu shot, almost. Exactly what he compares it to. He reasons that even if we do get an HIV vaccine one day, people might need boosters, maybe yearly or every six months, kind of like the flu shot. So this isn't just a start gap. It's potentially a long-term strategy model. That's how he frames it. A powerful vaccine-like approach that just fits much better into people's actual lives. And just when you think that's a peak, Gilead, the developer, is already working on making it even longer acting. Yeah, it's pretty amazing they're developing the same molecule to be given just once a year. Once a year. Imagine that. Though uh, that future version would be an intramuscular injection into the muscle, not the current subcutaneous one under the skin. Still, a single shot for a year's protection. That's the goal. Okay, this brings us to the next critical piece. We've talked about effectiveness, adherence, mm -hmm. but what about access? Especially given that initial $28,000 price tag, how does a drug like this reach people who need it most, particularly in you know high incidence, lower resource settings? This is absolutely crucial. And it's where Gilead Sciences made a really significant proactive move back on October 2nd, 2024. What did they do? They signed what are called non-exclusive, royalty-free, voluntary licensing agreements with six different pharmaceutical manufacturers. Importantly, four of those six are based in India. Voluntary licensing. What does that mean practically? It means Gilead is allowing these other companies to produce generic versions of lenacapavir without paying royalties specifically for certain countries. The stated goal is to support low-cost access in high-incidence, resource-limited areas. So they're enabling cheaper production. Exactly. And the agreement says Gilead will supply the drug at no profit to these regions until the generic manufacturers are fully up and running and can meet the demand. It's designed to bridge that access gap. That sounds like a major commitment to global health equity. Which countries are we talking about? It covers a list of countries really bearing the brunt of the HIV epidemic. Places like Botswana, Eswatini, Ethiopia, Kenya, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique. Namibia, Nigeria, okay. the Philippines, Rwanda, South Africa, Tanzania, Thailand, Uganda, Vietnam, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. Really critical regions. You know, to the Indian companies involved. Yes, specifically Dr. Reddy's laboratories, Mcure, Hetero, and Mylan, which is now part of Viatris. And these deals cover both prevention and treatment uses. That's another key point, yes. It covers lenacapavir for PREP, but also for treating those heavily treatment-experienced adults whose HIV has developed resistance to multiple other drugs. So it helps on both fronts. That's huge. So what does this actually mean for the price you know, on the ground in places like India? Well, according to Dr. Kumarasamy's insights, one of these Indian companies has already started the process of developing the generic version. Already? Yes. And he estimates it could become available perhaps as early as next year in India, pending local regulatory approval and safety studies, of course. And the projected cost. This is the big question. His estimate, around $100 per dose for the generic form of lenacapavir. $100. Down from, what was the original? Well, the U.S. list price is around $14,000 per dose, so $28,000 a year, going from that to potentially $100 per dose. That's that's completely transformative. It makes global access seem actually possible. It, it absolutely changes the entire landscape for health equity regarding HIV prevention and treatment. So we've really covered a lot today. From the uh, incredible science and the rapid approvals, through understanding why a long-acting injectable overcomes these huge real-world adherence problems, mm -hmm. and finally seeing how proactive licensing strategies can potentially make even expensive breakthroughs accessible globally, it's quite a story. It really is. A compelling example of how science and uh, smart public health approaches can work together to tackle a massive global challenge. Which shows a potential path forward. Which really brings up a final thought, maybe something for you, the listener, to consider. How might innovations like lenacapavir innovations that prioritize these long-acting solutions and build in global licensing from the start, how might that fundamentally reshape things? Reshape more than just HIV. Exactly. Could it change our whole approach to managing other chronic diseases? Could it be a blueprint for achieving better health equity worldwide across different conditions? The model here might have implications far beyond HIV. That's a really powerful question to leave us with keep diving into these vital topics with us because understanding the nuances of these advancements really does help all of us navigate the future of health with uh, hopefully a bit more insight. 